Welcome to Light Over Heat with Professor David Yamani. This week I want to talk about some insights I gained from attending a workshop at the Duke Center for Firearms Law last week. No one would ever mistake me for being a lawyer, much less a constitutional law professor, but a chance encounter with Jake Charles, who is the outgoing executive director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law, gave me the opportunity to attend a work in progress workshop two times, once in 2019 and once last week at the Duke Law School. And one of the things I really appreciate about this workshop is the diversity of attendees. So in this last meeting, you had, for example, an attorney for every town presenting work and also an attorney for the NRA presenting work. The ability to bring together a range of people from different ideological backgrounds and different perspectives on the Second Amendment made for an amazing and informational day. And the range of topics and the complexity of the work is really impressive. So for example, you have people like Deep Gulasekaram presenting on the denial of gun rights to non-citizens. You have Mugambi Jue presenting on mass incarceration as something that both pro-gun and pro-gun control activists have contributed to. You have Robert Leiter of the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason talking about how to properly understand the militia and hinting that he is going to make an argument that the individual right to keep and bear arms and the militia argument with respect to the Second Amendment can actually be understood as of a piece rather than as two separate components. Um, Eric Rubin uh, talked about the restoration of firearms rights to felons. Uh, Greg McGarrian talked about the relationship of the Second Amendment to the First Amendment, and it made a really strong argument for why those two things are different. And as I shared at the workshop, I hate slogans. I've been talking about slogans that I hate on this video series. And one of the slogans that I don't like is that the Second Amendment protects the First Amendment. I think that's way too simplistic an argument. Um, we had a very interesting comment and in reply between some scholars who argued uh, about a small arms race that creates a dysfunction in society. Uh, and George Moxery of the University of Wyoming Law School and Alexander Adams arguing against that case. So in general, very interesting back and forth, different takes on firearms law, different takes on the Second Amendment, but all presented in a scholarly and respectful fashion, which is what I'm all about, light over heat. Now, as I said, I'm a zero L, right? I've never attended law school. Uh, rather, I'm an empirical social scientist, so I did stand out a bit in this workshop. But the one thing that I took note of is how many arguments about firearms law implicate empirical data, right? That we need empirical data to back up certain claims about how guns work in society. So that gives me a little bit of a place in these kind of discussions. Um, and one of the things that I have long observed is the difficulty of establishing clearly the effect of a particular law on a particular outcome. And next week's video, I think, will address some recent studies which try to connect liberalized gun carry laws with some negative outcomes. And I talk about the problems in those papers and trying to make that connection. Now, I recently saw Andrew Morrell, who heads up RAND's gun research initiative, drawing on Philip Cook's work, distinguish between preponderance of the evidence versus beyond a reasonable doubt as two different yardsticks for moving from 
research to policy. So morale raises the question as to whether we should assess research in a particular area as speaking beyond a reasonable doubt as having a particular effect, or whether we should use a lower standard of a preponderance of the evidence suggests a certain outcome. Now, I don't have a set opinion on this yet. I can see how views of this are going to split along ideological lines relative to people's views of guns, but I think it's worth thinking about the level of evidence we would need to have in order to move from a body of research to specific public policy proposals. I'm sure that you all have some views on that, so please share them in the comments.